you can always go to YouTube, which I haven't made a link yet on the Moodle page, but I'll, I will. So you can go to the um, YouTube channel and watch the lectures if you miss it, or if it was really scintillating, or if I said something really stupid, and you need to share it with your friends, you know, whatever the case. So it'll be there as a reference for you. Um, just starting looking at the Moodle page, you can see the organization. It looks a little different for me than it does for you because I have things like there's a syllabus for physics 151. That's the algebra based class and a different one for physics 251. They're very slightly different. And so you see here, I have two of them listed, but you'll only see the one that's appropriate to you. The schedule, the lecture schedule that tells you what we're going to be doing every day and when homework, well, actually doesn't tell you when homework due. homework's due every day. It's simple. Um, <laughs> Then we have how we grade labs there, how I'm assessing the class to see if it was a successful or a failure. The textbook. This link that I put for the Physics 151 textbook, the textbook is free, okay? You don't have to pay a red cent for it. It's an online textbook. If you want a printed copy, you can get a very good quality printed copy for around $40. And um, what you need to do for that is simply go to the bookstore and tell them I would like a print copy of this and they order it. And so you can get a good copy if you want a print copy for very cheap. But of course, it's free to use it on the web. And if you use it on the web, it will have additional resources. Now, the link that I have here for the Physics 151 textbook, like I said, it doesn't work because I put in the link you need to use when you are doing the what we call I call reading quizzes, which I'll get about get to later. Um, there's a different textbook for the Physics 251 people. Their textbook has calculus. They're both free textbooks. The calculus-based textbook is called University Physics. That's so college physics students have the University Physics textbook. The algebra-based physics textbook is called College Physics. So the general physics students have the College Physics textbook. Clear? I think I should just change the names of my classes to match the textbook. Um, so you have things here the uh the useful sites here are just places you might look for additional help and i have lectures from previous years down here right now and homework assignments the first homework assignment is going to be due on wednesday and it's really really simple it's just learning how to use the homework site so let's get started with the stuff about the class i am trying to use OneNote. I've never used OneNote in teaching my classes before. And I see that it has a few things that aren't as ideal as I would like. Like I don't even know what that cross thing was in the middle. And it doesn't change pages as easily, but I'm trying to figure out the easiest way to get the stuff to you and have interaction with the students. So this lecture, if I did it right, should be available to you in OneNote. And 16 of you are already added to the OneNote class, and the others should have an invitation. I've never done this before, so I can't give you too much insights on how that's going to work. Okay, so looking at the syllabus, our textbook, College Physics for Physics 151, University Physics for Physics 152 is the textbook. They're free textbooks on the OpenStax website. You also need to have the lab guide. No one here has the lab guide mostly because I sent it to be printed yesterday. Um, the printing place that, you know, used to be called Inco's, I don't know if they just call it Copy Center now, will try to get it done by tomorrow morning. If it's not done by tomorrow morning, I will just put the first lab on Moodle and print out copies for you so you can have it. Um, I think the lab guide costs under $10. I try to keep the cost down. When we get to the homework, you'll see it's not free though. So the physics lab guide and then the free textbook are the textbooks. I put here the online places. The expert TA is where you're gonna be doing your homework. That costs $32.50 per semester. So for the entire year, that's $65. I want to move away from that, but for now, that's the best option I could find for the homework. And there's a link later on in the syllabus. If you go to Moodle, you can click the links. <laughs> and then the OpenStax tutor is for reading quizzes. Now, once again, I'm going to talk about these in a little bit, but those are the resources that we're using. Our class, everyone should know when our class is. Um, I'm actually going to change this. I forgot to. 
my office hours, I'll just be there from one to four instead of three to five. Um, are you Leslie Lopez? Yes. Here's a syllabus for you. Oh, thank you. And then the class times, <laughs> yes, 11 to 11.50 every day except today because what's happening after class? The solar eclipse, right? I'm so excited about that, and I hope that maybe it might be sunny because if it's not sunny, then seeing the sun disappear isn't nearly as fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> we have lab from 2 to 4.50 on Tuesday. Lab will meet right here at the same place as class. Um, our lab TA is going to be... Efron, I don't remember his last name. He's a he's already graduated and he's coming back. What are the objectives in the course? I have a clicker slide coming up. We're not. I don't even have the clicker software running, so don't worry about pulling out a clicker. You can if you want to know it, but I'm not going to get you. Oh wait, that's a fun. I thought that was a clicker that you were. <laughs> um, <clears throat> what I want students to have after this class is number one to understand the basic concepts of physics we're not looking for people to memorize equations so like when it comes to tests i'll give you all the equations but you have to look at things and figure out what's going on and know how to use it the the kind of thing that i like is when students after taking physics class you know send me an email like you totally ruined me. The other day I was driving down the road and I saw this car that had slid off the road. And I was like, oh, that must have happened because it didn't have, you know, it was ice in the road, the coefficient of friction wasn't high enough. And that's what I want. I want people to look at something and think about what let happened there. You know, and not just, huh, somebody crashed. And so that's the kind of thing I'm looking for. Um, the scientific method. Now, Many of you are science majors are going to be doing something very closely aligned with science. The scientific method is the basis of what makes something science. So we will in lab be focusing it. Students really don't like this. I'll tell you now, but I think it's really important focusing on trying to apply the scientific method in each lab to get some experience with using the scientific method. So let me just go over what the scientific method is. You'll find lots of statements of it. You could find lots of statements that will not be in full agreement with what I say, but they're all fundamentally the same. So the scientific method starts with observing something interesting. If you're gonna be a scientist, you have to be curious. So you observe something interesting. You say, hey, look, the sun disappeared. Why did the sun go away? Right? If you just say, oh, sun gone, that's not the scientific way of thinking. Then number two is create a hypothesis a hypothesis can be described as an educated guess that explains why it happens. But it has to have two more things. It also needs to be based on scientific information or scientific ideas. and make testable predictions. So we have the observation of the solar eclipse. How many people have seen Apocalypto? It's not a great movie, so I, I'm okay with just Irving. Um, Apocalypto, the whole crux of the movie is a solar eclipse. And you don't know that until you get halfway through the movie. It starts out with these people out, you know, living in the jungle, being happy, you know, hunting boar or something. And then soldiers come and they collect them all. And they take them and they're beheading them one by one. Why are they beheading them? Because there's a solar eclipse. Of course, the people in the know 
knew that they were peddling a false hypothesis. But the hypothesis that they peddled was that the gods were angry, and so the gods are taking away the sun. And that's actually a very common idea through cultures around the world, that when you have a solar eclipse, you know, the gods are angry, they're taking away our sun because they're angry at us. And so they're chopping off the heads of the people to appease the gods. And then the sun comes back, yay, we chopped off enough heads, they're good. That, that is a, a common conception that is existing. So that would be a hypothesis. The hypothesis, the sun is going away because the gods are mad. But it's not a scientific hypothesis. There is no linkage with any scientific knowledge we have that would say the, the sun being blocked by something has to do with gods being angry. So it's pseudoscience, as, as we would say, or religious. It's not a scientific hypothesis. And assuming that I finish going over the syllabus in time, I'll talk a little about the eclipse rather than you know, talking about the actual physics. It needs to make testable predictions. So they have their pseudoscientific hypothesis that the gods are angry, angry. And so their testable hypothesis was, if we kill enough people, we'll make the gods happy. And then it, it'll end. Seemed to work, right? Of course, if you hadn't put, cut off the heads, we know it would have still worked. So that's step two is creating a hypothesis that explains why the observation occurred is based on scientific ideas. Astrology is not a science because there is no connection that we know of in science between your life and the position of the sun versus, compared to the stars. So it's a non-scientific hypothesis, so we call it pseudoscience. Okay, step three is to test a prediction of your hypothesis so you know your hypothesis had testable predictions you run a test you running your test is not simply repeating the thing you observed and saying yep what i observed happened that's not testing anything it's doing something different and then step four is if test confirms, notice it does not prove, it confirms prediction. Didn't even confirm the hypothesis, it confirmed the prediction. Then test it differently. So for instance, in Apocalypto, they, they confirmed, hey, we cut off everybody's heads. The guys were happy, it went away. Well, now let's test it different. Let's see if we don't cut off any heads, what happens, right? You, you test it a different way. And then if it fails, then you have new information. You know something it's not. And so you modify your hypothesis. So with this, that's the entire system. It never ends. Because either it passes your test and you go and test a different way, or it fails your test and you go change your hypothesis. But every time you fail a test, you now have more information. It wasn't what I thought it was. And so over time, you should ideally get closer and closer and closer to a correct understanding. And so that's the scientific way of testing things. We're trying to get closer and closer, developing better and better ideas. So when we talk about things at the beginning of class, we'll talk about like Aristotle's ideas, which to us today seem laughable. Yet they were the best ideas they had then. And then Galileo came and said, well, let's test this idea. Fails miserably. Maybe we need to modify it. Okay, so that's number two there. Time, yes. We're halfway through class and I'm, I'm yeah. Okay, let's go faster. Um, I hope that you recognize that physics is everywhere in life. Physics, especially we physicists, believe is the most fundamental science. It's the science of everything around us. It's the science that deals with the physical world, right? Stuff you can touch, interact with, light. The physical world, that's what physics is. That's why it has the name physics. And so it's very fundamental everything you do, whether it's being able to walk on the floor without falling on your tail, or 
you know, checking what the weather's going to be in an hour using your iPhone. That's all using physics. And so I want people to recognize, yeah, this stuff is actually really important. It's everywhere. It's not really important that you understand everything about it, but it is a very important topic and understand why things occur. You know, why is the sky blue? We observe that every day. Most people don't know why. We'll get to, and I'll ask you the question, why the sky is blue. And we'll see a lot of people will have some interesting answers. And lastly, to be curious about the world, to not just sit back and say, uh, yeah, that's the way it is, but to actually think, why? Okay, so what are we gonna do in this class? During the first semester, we'll talk about motion. So we'll talk about kinematics first, is how things move, then dynamics, why they move. And we'll learn concepts like force and energy, momentum. And we'll spend at least half the semester on those ideas. And then we'll move into thermodynamics and waves. So we'll get um, sound waves. We won't get light waves until second semester. And we will spend some time talking about the history and development. And I always admit to students, when I was in college, I was your age. I hated that. I was like, who cares what Aristotle believed? I just want to learn what we know now. But I, like every other physics teacher, go through some of that historical background so you can understand how we've gotten to where we are. To not just think, ah, you know, it was easy. This was obvious at all times because what we know today was not obvious at all times. And of course, we want to develop that critical thinking. A lot of people here are probably pre-med. And you think, why, as a pre-med student, would I be taking physics? How many people have wondered that? Okay, not as many as I expected. Maybe the others are just shy about it. Or maybe I have the wrong perception. So, of course, as a pre-professional advisor going to um, Loma Linda, I and other physics teachers asked, so, so why is it that physics is required? And their answer was very simple. Because in physics class, we learn to think about things critically and differently than you do in most of your classes. And they want students to have developed that critical thinking that is pretty much standard in physics, and that's why physics is required for medical school. And of course, there are some applications, you know, <laughs> you're putting a bone in traction, there's physics there, right? But it, it's mostly for the thinking is why that's required. Math is a requirement of this class. We're going to be solving problems. And so you will need to be comfortable using algebra and trigonometry because you're going to use those excessively. And of course, if you're in physics 251, we'll also be using calculus, which we'll go over tomorrow. <laughs> I told you I'm not going to have you even pull out the clickers today, so don't worry about it. This is a question that I actually am always curious about. Why are you taking this? Um, every now and then I will have somebody who does this. It's really not the choice to make unless you're an advanced student. You know, I had somebody with a maid, my first year here got bad advising. You know, the major was something that was a liberal arts major and his advisor said, oh yeah, general physics will cover that requirement. And, you know, he comes in and it was much more difficult than he was used to. And, it made it very hard for him, you know. He, he passed the class, but it's better if it's one of the ones above. I just have thought, are you guys from the... Uh... Brian, yeah. I forgot to look at the roster for the Brian students. That's why you weren't on my list. That explains it. Okay, um, this will go through real quick. Classroom decorum, you know. Show respect, don't be loud, don't be um, sitting there texting on all during class and so on. If you have a learning difference, make sure you go to the Teaching Learning Center and they will help you get set up for how to deal with the accommodations appropriate for your learning difference. Academic integrity, I always like to say, don't cheat, <laughs> right? It's pretty obvious, um, but what is cheating is understood differently by different people. So I try here to specify things that are fair, things that are academically dishonest. So one of the most common things is doing homework. When you're doing homework, I very much believe in Steve Martin, two heads are better than one. 
or two brains are better than one actually, the man with two brains, right? Um, it's useful to study with other people because person A might understand problem one and be really confused about problem two. And person B might understand problem two, but really be really confused about problem one. And if you can explain how to do a problem to somebody else, that helps you probably more than it helps them. And so there's real benefits to people studying together. At the same time, there's no benefit at all if you just tell them, oh, this is the answer or here's the equation, right? There needs to be explanation. So if you just copy somebody's work or just, you know, oh, that's the equation, put in my numbers, there's the answer, and you don't go through the thinking process, then that would be academically dishonest. But if somebody explains it to you, shows you and explains how they did it, that's perfectly legit. You know, the same thing goes, you know, if somebody says, oh, how do you do the homework? You just give them your paper. Yeah, that would be academically dishonest. Explain it to them, you know, letting them look while you explain, that's all good. So it's kind of some fine gradations there. I want to make sure people understand. Um, other things, the things that have happened, um, you will be required to answer clicker questions every class period, not today, clearly. And sometimes people have to step out and go to the bathroom. And if a clicker question comes up while they're in the bathroom, what do they do? Well, it's tempting for somebody to say, oh, well, you know, Marvin's not here, so I'll just press a button on Marvin's because you're graded there just for participation, not for if you're right or wrong. And so just put in an answer, then nobody knows and Marvin gets credit. But Marvin didn't do the thinking. The reason for the clicker questions is so the students have to sit there and try to organize their thoughts. What do I really think about this? What do I really understand? And you know, you clicking for somebody else, they didn't go through the process of the thinking, which is what the credit's for. So, you know, that's an academic dishonesty issue. Another one that's so obvious and yet's happened more than once is people using their cell phones during tests. Yeah, I know that should not happen, but it, it's happened more than once. Um, I have a simple policy. If you have your cell phone with you during the test and I find out you'll get a zero on the test, even if it's in the pocket. So we just, I warn you before each exam. So people don't like, Oh, I forgot. And we'll put all our books and cell phones up here in the front and then it shouldn't be a problem. Okay. Bottom line still don't cheat. So what's your grade going to be made up of? 5% will be clicker participation. Now I have the long descriptions coming up after this. I'm not even going to stop on them. I'm just going to talk about them here. Clicker participation. That's not clicker correctness. It's participation. So what is clicker participation? Periodically, I will ask you a question that has you know, multiple choice answers. And you will put in your best guess. My goal here is for you to think about what we've talked about and think about what you understand. And so I'm not going to grade you on if you're right or if you're wrong. Simply on did you respond. But you're cheating yourself if you just, and you know, last semester I had students who do this. They just hit an answer as soon as it came up and not even worry about reading the question. That's taken away from the learning experience, right? There's actually research to show that this helps you learn physics. And in fact, these clickers that we use on campus were, uh, they're sold by a company developed by a physics professor so that he could use them in his physics class for pedagogy, did a lot of pedagogical research. So those clickers, the clickers you can use in all of your classes that the teachers use them. I don't know how common there are, but a lot of students have them. Unfortunately, we actually went with this. Ah, this is our tutor. I'm, I'm probably just really late. This is Jordan Bissell. If you turn to the last page of the uh, syllabus, you'll see all of Jordan's contact information. He will be doing tutoring by arrangement, by appointment. So you contact him, give it at least a day in advance so you know he can check his calendar and not like, uh, <clears throat> I was gonna eat supper in five minutes. And you can arrange and Jordan will help you. He was in class last year. He, of course, was a good student. <laughs> Otherwise, we wouldn't have him. So everybody, Jordan, Jordan, everybody, they all have names. <laughs> Uh, feel, yeah. free, feel free to uh, to contact me, and and you know it's not any mark against you. It, you know sometimes you just need a different perspective on, on things and everything. So uh, that was yeah. me when he said a mark against you, by the way. <laughs> uh, so yeah, 
uh, feel free to contact. Uh, and I have random gaps throughout my page that I, I can fill with uh, tutoring. Some okay. of that stuff. So I put evening there, but also has gaps yeah. around it. So uh, email or text, either way, whatever is easiest for you, it's easiest for me. And, uh, and just contact me and work things out. So, yeah. Thanks, Aaron. Yep. Okay. So the clickers, there is money with the clickers. They work in multiple classes. They, we went with these clickers because at the time we made the decision, we were looking at a couple different companies, and they were the cheapest option. It was like $25 for a clicker, and you could just use it forever. You could pass it on to the next person, the next person. It seemed like a good idea. They realized they didn't make enough money. And so they came out with newer, newer clickers. You know, people buy the new ones, but you don't get rid of the old ones because they still work. So now they've gone to a subscription plan, which makes me sad and angry. Because with the subscription plan, you have to buy a subscription for, you know, was it the year? And every year you have to buy a subscription. Now the good news about that is you can use your um, cell phone or iPad as your clicker. So you don't have to buy hardware if you have a smart, well, smartphone, if you have a dumb phone. Yeah. <laughs> but you don't have to buy hardware if you have a smartphone. You just download the app, it's called Turning Point, I think. And then you have to go through and make an account and register the account through Moodle so I can get the information about your responses. So there's information about the clickers on Moodle for what you need to do there. And I apologize that there is money associated with those things. <laughs> right, the textbook was free. I want to make things cheaper. <laughs> okay, so the reading quizzes. Before every lecture where I'm lecturing about new material, so if I'm doing a review lecture, there will not be, but for most lectures, there'll be new material. You will need to go to OpenStax Tutor, which is associated with our textbook, and answer questions. I could not choose the number of questions. I wanted to lower it. But I have no choice. It's three questions for every section, plus I believe it's three questions that are what they call spaced learning. Spaced learning, once again, this is actually the latest in pedagogical research, says that students learn better if they face questions from one and two weeks ago along with the new material. So the three questions that are space learning will be ones not from the coming up lecture, but from previous lectures. And so those questions have an interesting format, once again, based on pedagogy research, pedagogical research, you will first have a box for you to put a free form answer. So it'll ask you a question like, you know, why is the sky blue? And you might say, well, because rainy scattering is uh, proportional to one over wavelength to the fourth power, and since blue light has a very short wavelength, it is much more strongly scattered by radius scattering. Hence, blue light from the sun gets scattered in all directions. Or you might say something else, but that would be the right thing to say. And then after you've entered that, you'll go to a multiple choice, and you'll choose the answer that you believe is correct there. You're graded on the multiple choice answer. Well, what I found once again was last year, some students would just put in like QQQ, and go to the multiple choice and completely skip the thinking part of the question. And that, once again, takes away from the learning aspect. So this year, I will periodically go through and check to make sure people are putting in meaningful answers in the freeform answer box. And if they're not, I'll adjust the score because you're not actually doing the project. The, the reading quiz questions, the first assignment is going to be over chapter one and chapter two, one to three. It's going to be like 27 questions. Or, well, I think it's less than that, but it's a lot of questions. Most of them won't be that long. Fortunately, the homework that's due on Wednesday will take very little time, so it's not going to be terrible. So this OpenStax tutor will cost you $10 a semester. Now, OpenStax Tutor does have a homework service. I was all excited I was going to use it. Problem is, you know, according to their literature, the average scores in the homework are around 80%. And 80%, I 
find students get a little depressed if that's their homework average. And so I want to go with something that's going to be a better success rate. And also with the homework site that we're using, which is expert TA. So it's 32 50 per semester for the expert TA. You have like five chances at the question. You'll lose 3% if you put in the wrong answer. You can ask for hints and lose 2% for a hint. So you lose a little less than putting in the wrong answer for a hint. But when you click the hint, you know you're losing 2%. When you put in your answer, you at least should hope that you're putting in the right. But it, it has ways to help you learn and give you multiple chances. So, you know, if you answer the question wrong all five times, that's equivalent to, you know, the average score that you'd have the other homework site. So it, I chose this, staying with this, you'd have better success. Also, it randomizes numbers, whereas the OpenStax one right now doesn't randomize numbers. So if we had people in the cheating mind and somebody says, oh, the answer for that one was 5.75, then somebody else just put 5.75 and not go through any learning. I don't remember the price for the clickers or I'd put that there. Homework will be due at actually 11.55 p.m. is what it says in Moodle. It's 11.59 p.m. is what I put in the actual homework site on the lecture period following when we talked about it. So for instance, if I was talking about actual physics content today, then we would have a homework assignment over what I talked about today that would be due Wednesday night at 11.55 p.m. The reason to have it at 11.59, or 11 whatever. The reason to have it then is so in class you could ask these questions about it. Um, <clears throat> because I'm not talking about any physics content, the homework assignment that will be due on Wednesday by 11.59 p.m., is actually simply how do you use the expert TA site. So it goes through and shows you how you use it, how you answer. So the expert TA site, once again, there is a link in the syllabus. If you go to Moodle, you can click on that link and not have to type it all in. And it goes through for creating the account. In the expert TA, you have a two week trial period. So even if there's zero chance that you would drop the class, I still recommend that you go take advantage of that two week trial period. The problem is at the end of that two week trial period, you have to have your credit card ready, or you could go to the bookstore and you know use your account there, but you can't do homework until you pay at the end and you can't pay during the trial period. You have to wait until it expires, then you can pay, unless they've updated the system. It's kind of inconvenient because you're like, it's gonna expire tomorrow, let me pay now. No can do. <laughs> okay, so we have homework. The homework is 15% of your grade. The reading quizzes are only 5%. They're a small percentage. Laboratory. Labs will meet every week. We will have exams during lab periods. So four of our lab periods will actually be exams. The rest of them will be actual exams or actual laboratories. Um, we're gonna start with laboratory tomorrow, which is I'll do some lecturing We'll take a pretest for a little bit of extra credit. It's not shown here. The pretest will show what you knew coming into class. And then about halfway through the semester, you'll take it again, post test, and we'll see how much you learned. I use that to gauge the success of the actual student learning. And so you'll get a little extra credit for the two. It's not a lot, but I want to make it so it's not punitive. punitive. Um, exams, we will have four exams through the semester plus one final exam. And the final exam is cumulative over the entire semester. The other exams are not. At the end of the semester, I will take your four highest of the five exams. So that includes the final exam. I'll drop the lowest one. That means the final exam can be dropped. So for instance, if we get to the end of the semester and you have an A without taking the final exam, there's no point in taking the final exam because it's not going to change your grade. Unless I make a mistake, which I did last year. I had to change like six people's grades because I made a mistake. But, you know, I corrected it. And then there's attendance. You saw me taking tests. I said I'm going to do this every day. Questionnaire. Um, on the exams, will we get them back yes. to study the final? Sure. Um, attendance, back when it was required for teachers to take attendance, I said, if I'm going to take this, I'm going to make it useful. I generally am not a fan of the idea of 
Well, he tried really hard, so I'm going to give him credit for that. But this is the one area where I give the effort points. If you have, quote, perfect attendance, then I give you a 2% bonus. Now, that's a huge bonus, but it has to be perfect. Of course, what's perfect? Union College allows you to miss one class in the semester for every day that you have lecture during. Well, it's a policy that has been published like once or twice. <laughs> and so I stick with it for every day of the week you have lecture. So we have lecture three days a week if you're in physics 151, four days a week if you're in physics 251. And so that means perfect attendance would be if you're in physics 151, you could have three absences and still be considered perfect. I go through further and I say present on time is equal to three points and late by five minutes or less is equal to two points late by more than five minutes or leaving during class i've had students come for the beginning of class i'm here and then go get lunch and then come back after they've eaten lunch and be here at the end. That's not here. Um, or people who have just sat there and texted all during class. That's also not here in my book. So that gets you one point. And then of course, absent or excused is equal to zero points. Now you, you might say, why is absent and excuse the same? because you're allowed three excuses. And I don't ask you, what's your excuse? I just say the first three you miss are excused, right? So you can be the judge of if it's excused or not, all I am gonna count is you know, the points. And so since present on time is three points and you can be, if you're in physics 151, you can have three absences, that means you get a bonus if you lose nine or fewer points on this attendance point scale. So that's, that's the effort score. If you really made the effort to, you know, come pay attention and learn. Any questions about these great things? Yeah. Um, if the class before runs over, like if I'm running all the way from the building, uh, will I still be counted late by five minutes? Um, as a general rule, yes. I mean, talk to me. There might be situations where I would bend it, but as a general rule, yeah. So, I mean, do talk to me. Don't just assume, yeah, I'm in trouble. Any other questions? Okay, let's skip about seven pages here. Oh, yes, I am doing exams differently. One of the things that students have disliked about my classes are the exams. And the reason is all of the questions were questions that you had to think about <laughs> and explain, not just think, not just think. That makes it sound a little too harsh. You have to explain your thinking. And a lot of times, if you know what the answer is, the student doesn't want to explain their thinking. They just want to move on. And so I've got my, you know, I'm looking for this many points. Well, two points for a figure, three points for explanation of the ideas involved, two points for identifying the right equations two points for doing the right work and one point for getting the right answer. That's the way I was graded. And, you know, so students who would just put the right answer and move on got one point. They lost nine because they didn't show any understanding. They only got the right answer. So I, I'm using a different I, approach to my exams. You'll have 10 multiple choice matching or true and false questions that will just be graded right or wrong. And then you'll have five application multiple choice problems. They'll again, just be graded right or wrong. And then you'll have five problems where I give you the right answer, but you have to go through the steps of drawing the appropriate figure, explaining the process and finding the right equations, doing the right work. So for those, you'll have the right answer already, but you have to show how to get that right answer to get the credit. So, that's how the test will be made. Um, I will make a dummy test and give it to you so you can at least have an idea of what it would look like. There is one more thing I didn't mention in the homework because it's not a required part. I told you that the, the reading quiz site has homework problems. I'm going to assign homework assignments there that do not matter to your grade, 
right? They're not extra credit. They're not anything to your grade, but they are further problems you can do. And I will draw heavily on those for making the exams. That is, I will look through problems that I assigned there and modify somewhat to put in the exam so that you do have some exposure to the types of questions that will be on the exam. Okay, and I've talked about all of this stuff. Final things, how do you get an A? Here's the minimum percentages for the letter grades. I do round, so where it says 93%, I actually take 92.5 and up, and that gets the A. You'll notice there is no C minus because that's a philosophical thing. I believe C minuses are passing grades. Union College believes that C minus is not a passing grade if it's for your major, right? C minus means you pass, but you were weak in it. And Union College's approach is C minus means you can't go on. And so I just don't assign that grade and I don't have any problems. <laughs> okay. This is the very final thing. How do you know what's coming up? Well, you can look on Moodle. Moodle will have all the assignments there for you. But you can also look and say, OK, we are going to have a reading quiz assignment. Normally, it'd just be over 2, 1 to 3, but we also have 1, 1 to 4 because you didn't have reading quiz before today. Um, so we're going to have a reading quiz assignment on Wednesday over chapter 1 and 2, 1 to 3. And we're also going to always have a homework assignment if we had a lecture on the preceding day. So since we had a lecture there, that means we're also going to have a homework assignment. Except for, like I told you, this homework assignment will simply be, how do we use the homework site? So you will need to go and make your accounts for the homework site and for the reading quiz site and do the reading quiz and do the educational homework. That first homework, they tell you to make mistakes. They tell you to put in the wrong answer. Go ahead and do what they tell you to do. You should still get a score above 80%. Everybody with a score above 80% will get 100% of the assignment. So don't be freaking out like, I can't answer wrong. It's going to lower my grade. It won't. And, you know, the only way you get under 80% is if you actually don't do it. So this tells you where everything is. Here's what we're going to do in the lab on Tuesday. There's what we're going to do in class tomorrow for calculus class. So you can look there at the schedule and understand what we're doing. I have exactly one minute left. I so wanted to talk about the eclipses. How often do we have an eclipse? A solar eclipse. That's what you would believe if you read the news. So yeah, okay. So in the US, you're getting closer now. Eclipses occur actually somewhere in the world there's some kind of solar eclipse approximately every six months but solar eclipses can be total eclipses or they can be annular eclipses this graph is showing all of the total eclipses in a 25-year period and if you count them up it's i think it was 18 i counted them before class but i don't remember what the number was so about 18 25 years for total eclipses they're not all that rare and yet why is this a once in a lifetime thing The sun, is, the sun is being blocked by the moon. The shadow of the moon will be striking right here in Lincoln. And it is sunny out right now, so keep praying. <laughs> the, the eclipse, by the way, will start in 16 minutes, but it will be 102 before it's total. So it'll just, bites out of the sun will be moving. It's very rare to actually see the total eclipse because only where the blue is do you see the total eclipse. And so if you look in this 25-year period, in the United States, there are only two eclipses in that 25-year period. And the most shocking thing is if you lived right there, you would get to see both of them, both this year's and the one in 2024. I won't go through the geometry 